Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Jahu Fal. I'm the Secretary General of the Commonwealth Association of Technical Universities and Polytechnics in Africa, which has recently been rebranded to the Association of Technical Universities and Polytechnics in Africa. And basically, it has now become a pan-African organization embracing all countries in Africa. Africa is ably represented. I can see we have members from East Africa, from West Africa, and also from Southern Africa. WFCP, thank you very much for the invite. We are most delighted to be in this beautiful um, country of yours. I'm sure we are going to take along some nostalgic memories um, of the beautiful hospitality that we have enjoyed uh, 48 hours ago since we arrived. Thank you once again. I am privileged enough to be um, speaking on an issue, really, that has been spoken about since yesterday, um, and adequately so. I would just say that what is going to happen here is going to be like consolidating the conversations that took place between yesterday and the beautiful presentations that we've had. So my job is quite easy. It's just a matter of putting things together. All the really um, essential issues of the theme, which is TVET for Excellence for All, has been adequately um, um, talked about. The continent of Africa, um, let me add that the association that I represent has got 200 members that are universities, polytechnics, and colleges in 20 countries in Africa. So when I speak, I don't speak for the um, basis of the country of my region. I speak for the, for the continent of Africa. I mirror what is happening in all these countries, and especially in these member institutions of ours. The, the continent of Africa is one of the most diverse regions in the world, and having a huge advantage of a youthful population with almost 23%, 22.7% of the global youth population. And this is something that we always talk about, that we are really on the um, competitive advantage of having a youthful population. But what do we do with this? It's a massive advantage. But what do we do with this? It means we have the majority of our population um, as youth, and they need to be adequately engaged. When you do that, it means they are not going to be left idle, but at the same time, they are going to be contributing effectively to the socioeconomic development of the continent. As players in, in Tibet sector, and having been recognized that this sector is vital for the human and social economic development in Africa. We continuously engage the youth and the resources that are available so that we remain relevant. It is important that we in Africa, and that is for the rest of the world, remain relevant in the world that we live in. The Tibet sector has the potential to increase employment. We've spoke about employment and self-employment being some of the avenues that can really engage the youth in general. And that the Tibet delivery systems should be well placed to train the skill and the entrepreneurial work, workforce. 
Um, this is adequately defined in the African um, Union Commission and also resonated in the 2063 agenda, the, the Africa we want. The acquisition of skill, the rolling out of skill development could only be done if it is relevant, if it is accessible, and of course, if it is affordable. If those three key areas are not met, then we may just end up having some rhetorics without able to achieve those goals that we have set ourselves to do. And as you know, we are all into the Tibet sector, that this is a sector that is capital expensive, or I would say capital intensive. And as a result, for you to make it relevant, for us to make it relevant, it means that we are preparing our graduates adequately so that when they leave the shores of the training institutions, they would be able to gain employability. They will be able to register employability. If they would be employed, it means the infrastructure that we have in place in our institutions, in our training providers, would, should be having those facilities, those infrastructure that they, the graduates, would be able to meet when they are in the real world. In the absence of that, we always talk about the mismatch between the two. Coming to my area, of discussion, which is on equity and also on inclusion. We want to bring everyone on board. We don't want to leave anyone behind. And that includes all the marginalized groups. When we say the marginalized groups, I think two main groups come to mind, and that is us, the women and those people living with disabilities. There are other groups also, as you can see in my um, slides, some slides that I've already projected. But the, the two main groups that are disadvantaged, that are marginalized in many aspects, are the women and those living with um, disabilities. The twin principles of equity and inclusion. Different studies across Sub-Saharan Africa has identified issues of equity and inclusion as main challenges of Tibet participation across the continent. The AUC Continental Strategy for Tibet highlights the continuous stereotyping of certain skills against females, even though women constitute more than half of the workforce in many countries in the continent. There are also recent studies by the International Labour Organization um, a high representative is present, and I'm sure my, my data is rightly corrected. Um, shows that the 24 countries across regions of the African continent, females lagged behind males in terms of enrollment in Tibet. We have another example from UNESCO that also quotes a similar result. And it says that in countries where informal employment is prominent, women are more likely to be overrepresentative in the informal sector. Now, we talk about inclusion, we talk about equity. Yes, we want to include all. 
we want to make sure that it's fair play across the board. And looking at a particular group of the marginalized, which is women, we see that most of the times in Tibet in general, women are not adequately represented in terms of participation. So what do we do? We look out where the women participation is. And then as practitioners, as players of Tibet, we then include those areas of participation that women are. I'll give you an example. We've been talking about the green skills. There are a high number of women participation in some green, green skill or green um, careers, and also in some blue careers. What do we do as Tibet providers to make sure that we bring them on board in recalibrating those skills that they are practicing on? And in addition to that, to increase the value chain involved in those activities that women practice either in green or in skill areas. What are you doing? At the end of the day, we want to make sure that the employment that is being gained by the marginalized groups would actually be enhanced. That the low pay that was collected or that is being collected under normal circumstances, let's look at the, the area of fisheries in the blue economy, where you have most cases men going out to do the fishing, um, and then the women would be engaged in the trade of the fishes. This is, this is really in sub-Saharan Africa where especially you have the ocean resources available. And uh, what do they go out with? It's just a matter of how would they be able to sustain themselves, maybe for a day. But if Tibet sector, the Tibet sector, the practitioners ourselves, are able to re-engineer those courses that are participated by women or dominated by women, and to be able to enhance and give a value chain to those activities, then it means economically they would be able to translate into a better salary or a better wage at the end of the day. The Tibet programming in general in Africa has emerged as inequitable and discriminatory. Um, probably it is unintended that the bias that we see are things that are just stereotyped and we have picked. We have just picked over the years, you know, from the society, from the educational institutions in general. And as a result, you know, it just became a norm, sort of. And there is no sensitive lens being worn um, by us that are the practitioners, by us that are the players in this civil sector, to be able to improve and change and make sure that we incorporate and include the groups. Um, some of them are highlighted there. Like I said, it is mostly with those that have got disabilities or women, but the other groups are also affected. How do we bring all of them on board? How do we make sure that it is all inclusive, that no one is left behind? And that, that is, there is fair play across the board, equity. How do we do that? We are the practitioners. Many a times, we don't even have the mechanisms and the structures in place in our training and provider, a, a provide, a training institutions to be able to accommodate and ensure that they are equally, equally remunerated, that they are equally given the facilities and the opportunities to be able to go in and take those causes of their, of, of their choice. There is no re restriction. But is that the reality? In many cases, it's not. You have members of these groups that are academically inclined and can participate fully well. 
But then the support is absent. The support is absent. Someone who is having hearing impaired would need extra support to be able to be in a, in a mixed um, institution with you know, um, those that are not affected uh, with, with hearing, hear, 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 hearing impairment. But then the support is not there. And as a result, they are excluded. So these are the, the, the things that we, we capture and as an association is one of the, one of the things that we always amplify as the representative of Africa, as the representative of the Tibet voice in Africa. I'm saying that because that's the type of collaboration that my institution, Atupa, is enjoying with the African Union. You want to reach out to the rest of Africa, post-secondary institutions in Africa, talk to Atupa. And that is why we are always um, partnering with the African Union Commission in a lot of ways to be able to extend the message and ensure that what we are talking of today, well, the theme says it, that let's add our voice. We are adding our voice, but we are also going to take action um, to ensure that all the beautiful messages that we've heard in terms of how do we bring Tibet relevant? How do we make sure that the of causes that are offered are relevant, that we stay relevant in this sector? We've heard about the skilling, the upskilling, and the reskilling of Tibet. Yes, we want to stay relevant. And in order to stay relevant, we need to look into those areas that need to be recalibrated. The amount of and type of offers five years ago, 10 years ago, are no longer relevant. We know how technology has played a pivotal role in making sure that we can do a lot of things nowadays that we were not able to do probably some, some years ago. And, uh, it's not going to stop there. This is the message and this is the conversation that when we train, when we organize for training, what do we do? We make sure that we look for the future skills, the future jobs. That the job that we are training for our students, our graduates today, may go irrelevant in the next two or three or five years. So that is why we're thinking big, we're thinking ahead, but we are also looking at the sectors that are not really well captured by the excluded, the groups that have been left out. The stereotyping is still alive and kicking, and we know that. Um, a question was posed as to how many of us would actually um, encourage our own children to do professions outside Tibet, and I tell you, many of us are practicing that. How many of us would really encourage our own children to go into Tibet? Some of us are doing it, but many of us are not. You look at the institutions themselves, the signs that tells you that there is no stereotyping are few. The dynamics are changing, I must, I must confess. Um, I realized my very first year in Kenya, I had a tour of the member institutions and I was amazed to see those departments that we term as male-oriented, the male-dominant, the hard skills, Tibet hard skills. We are actually uh, being headed by, by female heads of department. And that is encouraging, you know, because at the same time you are showing that there is no stereotyping going on in here. And if a female um, could, could head the department, then it means that is an encouragement for more, um, for more female to, to participate.
for more, for more students to, to participate. I need this slide. So in, in essence, I am saying that there is call to action. What is the call to action? We need to be more sensitive to both equity and inclusivity. In the programming of TVET, we need to recalibrate TVET because the future is TVET for improved economic growth. So let us give the future generations a better life than ours. We leave no one behind. Let us not only add voice, but let us also take action. Tibet for excellence, or Tibet excellence for all, and add your voice. The mandate of ATUPA is basically to promote skills development in Africa, and that's what we have been doing since inception um, 44 years ago. Thank you very much, Eskerek, Asko, Gracia, merci beaucoup.